Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's ASA webinar. Our topic today is Understanding the Legal Needs of Aging, which is part of the Empowering Professionals in Aging series presented by Homestead Incorporated, franchisor of the Homestead Network. We will be getting started shortly. Just a few housekeeping notes before we do. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab on your screen labeled Resources. And under the tab labeled CE Application here, you'll find information on how to obtain CE credit for this event. You have 60 days to complete a continuing education application, and it will take up to 30 days for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are not logged in directly into this webinar, that is if you're watching as part of a group, you will not be eligible for CEUs as we have no way of tracking your online attendance. You will need to register using your own email address and then use your own confirmation URL um, in order to be able to obtain CEUs. If you have any questions today during the presentation, you can send those to us at any time using the question box. We will save the last 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes of today's program to get to those questions. We have two fantastic presenters lined up for today. Our first, Kathleen Spikesman Pallison, opened Bethman Pallison Law Offices in 2013 with her father, a longtime private practice attorney and Douglas County District Court Judge. An attorney and community volunteer, she crafts unique solutions for her clients. Every family, every situation, every detail can be different. Her practice focuses on civil litigation, adult guardianship, and conservatorship cases, probate, adult guardian ad litem appointments, adoption and, uh, and elder law issues, including Medicaid asset protection, caregiver agreements, and Medicaid spin-down cases. April Ibarra, a gerontologist and strategic partnership manager for Home Instead, has been with them for more than 20, has more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare and aging field. She is passionate about improving the lives of older adults through advocating, educating, and providing resources to help people live their highest quality and most independent life. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. We're so happy to be here. And Kathleen, we're just thrilled that you could join us and provide your expertise. Well, thank you for inviting me. All right. We have so much to cover, guys, and there's never enough time to talk about the legal needs of aging. So let's jump in. I'm sure it's no surprise to you that 80 million Americans are reportedly conversation avoiders especially when it comes to important topics such as legal needs. They haven't talked about any important end-of-life issues uh, with uh, their families, and um, they just avoid the subject. You know, 70% of family conversations about aging are prompted by an event such as a health crisis or other emergency. No surprise to everyone on this call, I'm sure. And these conversations are highly personable and personal and very emotional. But the, here's the good news. We all have an opportunity to make a difference by encouraging these conversations. I can't stress that enough. It's one of my passions to really get people talking about their wishes and uh, preparing in a legal way is necessary so that their wishes can uh, be achieved. Objectives for today, we want to understand the importance of planning for the possibility of becoming incapacitated and for the distribution of property after death. That's a big one right there. We want to identify what legal documents are important for adults to, to have as they age. And we want to clarify and talk about some misconceptions around legal implications of Medicaid planning. And then we'll identify some resources and legal experts that can help you prepare the necessary documents. Um, you know, I like this slide, and as I was preparing for this, I am not the legal expert. I look at everything from the aging perspective, but fortunately, Kathleen is here to guide us. But, you know, oftentimes people think they don't need to plan, um, and, and I'm sure it surprises all of you on this call. I was shocked to see some of these things uh, from all these famous people, such as Prince and Barry White and Heath Ledger, people who died without a will people who were separated but not divorced, 
people who had not updated their wills after they had children. So these were famous people who really had um, made some big, big, big mistakes. And often people think, well, I don't need to plan because I don't have anything. That's not true at all. And that goes to uh, the simple fact that everyone has something of value to them, whether it's money or estates. Uh, vehicles, jewelry, or it's grandma's yellow pie plate. So um, you don't have to be rich to have assets and to need a legal plan. And I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions when we talk about legal needs. People just think that they there is no need because they have nothing. And quite frankly, if you die without a will or an estate plan, you relinquish all your assets to the state laws. So in that respect, regardless of what you have to share um, after your death, what regardless of your estate, um, there is a need to plan. So uh, let's get into the nitty gritty. So Kathleen, what's the difference? Can you walk us through wills versus estate plans and just kind of get us all on the same page with, with these, uh, these terms? Sure, thank you, April. Um, the will is just, one document in a whole plan. So the estate plan um, involves several documents. That includes the will, that's a legal document, your power of attorney for finance, your power of attorney for health, a living will, and any testamentary trust that you want. So the estate is really everything that person owns and the whole plan addresses all of those assets. The will is just the one document that expresses the person's wishes as to how everything should be distributed at death. You can include some things in a will, like a recommendation for a guardian for your children, or even a recommendation for a guardian for yourself. Uh, but the will is just one piece of the bigger estate plan. That's so fascinating. And you, you mentioned power of attorney for finance, power of attorney for health, two totally separate documents, right? Correct. And the power of attorneys yes. are in place when the person is alive. Your personal representative named in your will takes over upon death. And so the power of attorney for finance and health are two different documents. They can be the same, but, but it's, it's better to do them separately. They can be the same person or different people. So for one family, the financial planner's son is the power of attorney for health, and the daughter, who's a physician, is actually the power of attorney for health care for her parents. So you can divide those responsibilities easily with two gotcha. different documents. Good. Good. Yeah, I was asking that question specifically because a perfect example of not having everything in place, my aunt was recently hospitalized uh, um, two weeks before I was trying to get her to move into her senior apartment. Um, and quite frankly, she had an infection which made her, uh, her mental status changed. So she really couldn't sign the lease. And her son has uh, power of attorney for her health, but not for her finance, and he could not help. And maybe that's not 100% accurate, but it was a good example to me of what can go wrong, right? Right, right, and, exactly. Yeah. You want to have the same person sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, quite you know, he's really the, the one family member besides me. So, you know, everybody talks about uh, the value um, of planning, but they're not making it a priority. As, uh, as this slide here talks about. Uh, everybody says, 59% of people will say it's very or somewhat important uh, to plan and to have a will or a living trust, but in reality, um, only about 32% of people really do take that step. So um, everyone on this call, whether you're a professional or a family member or you're, uh, you know, you're aging yourself, we have an opportunity to take this information and really start to get our ducks in a row. Getting the conversation started, I'll, I'll kind of uh, talk about this a little bit, and Kathleen, I'd love to get your uh, point of view, but any conversation you're having with an older adult is always difficult, right? And and it takes more than one conversation. It's a, um, think of it as breadcrumbs, 
You know, we have to start the conversation and then pick it up and continue it on. And if we don't start that conversation early enough, we're going to be in trouble. And, and I'm dealing with that again currently with, with my aunt. And it's very personal and very emotional. Um, everyone has different points of view. And of course, when we're talking about legal stuff, we're talking ab about, you know, recognizing that at some point we're going to be incapacitated. We not may not be able to make decisions for ourselves. So, it, you know, it is tough, but you can pick, um, pick you know, some, some tips here to really try to, to get those started. And first of all, do it at, at a time where it's not the crisis best advice I could give you, and you all know this as well as I do. Um, unfortunately, people don't plan ahead, and the crisis is the time the conversation gets started, and it can get very difficult for everyone. So don't wait till the crisis. Clearly, if you're starting ahead and you have the opportunity, you're sincere about your intentions. Um, and I, again, recently had this conversation with my aunt, and I said, if you don't make these plans for yourself, there's going to be a time very soon when someone's going to make them for you. Uh, and sure enough, two weeks later, uh, she got a very bad infection and she had a fall. She was on the floor overnight and now she's been in the hospital and in rehab. So it does happen. It's, it's, it's very likely uh, if we don't really get everything set up. And we need to stress the importance and the benefit uh, to everyone in, uh, uh, impacted. So it's not just the aging adult, but it's all the family members. Kathleen, you probably had a lot of experience with this. Do you have anything else to add on getting this conversation started? Yeah, I would add um, the biggest thing is, is the whole topic is emotional, right? Each child, yeah. you know, no matter what their age and stage is, they all act differently when a parent gets sick or dies. And that's the, yeah. the most common scenario. And those parents making their wishes known ahead of time, whether it is grandma's special pie plate or a big investment account, making those wishes known in writing really cuts down on the arguments because it's very easy to say, well, mom and dad wrote this down, so this is what they wanted. Um, I will say mediation in the elder law arena is, is increasing because, you know, more people, not enough people are preparing, not enough people are doing their wills. And, and people are fighting over things and, and they're going to mediation versus trial like oh. like other things, you know, and, and that hurts like feelings. That. And th those are lifelong, you know, problems if you don't have it just it avoids so much anxiety if you do it ahead of time. Um, yeah, I always have my clients do a personal property list. I have found in my oh. practice that they they fight more over the pie plate, mom's wedding ring, you know, <laughs> I can things imagine. like that. Yeah, that aren't specifically listed on a personal property list. And so I include that at the end of my wills so everybody knows exactly where the family Bible is going to go or exactly where mm -hmm. that antique car is going to go. Um, so they get very specific about um, items that have emotional value because the whole thing is emotional. Yeah, it really is. Uh so planning it is helpful. So this this let's talk about the steps to creating an estate plan because you said there's all these documents to go to an estate plan and I know when you, I hear the word estate plan I think oh boy they have an estate. Well again we already know that that's not uh, you don't have to have a lot uh, you know to need an estate plan. So do you mind walking us through um, the 12 steps to create an estate plan or just kind of giving us an overview? Sure absolutely. So. You know, many firms start with a questionnaire, which I have that, and I draft all of my estate plan documents from the one questionnaire. It is lengthy, but it's very detailed, and you only have to fill it out once, and I extract the information I need for the will, the power of attorney, power of attorney for health, uh, any funeral plans. The whole estate plan is on that one questionnaire. I will say on average, it takes a person about six months to return the questionnaire. It's just something oh, wow. that's not a priority, you know, and that seems yeah, like a long yeah. time and, and they're time. very apologetic. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, they're putting some thought into it and that's, you know, that's what I want. Um, yeah, raises a and, lot of questions that they probably hadn't considered. Right. Now, sometimes as a practice pointer, if I get a phone call from a child that says my parents want to do their will, I will make an appointment 
and meet with the actual clients, that being the parents. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the kids get a little aggressive and and they want to be in on the meeting and I have to draw those boundaries as to who's the client here, who am I serving, who is driving the bus here. So I, I will do a face-to-face yes. meeting as well just to be safe and kind of determine their competency, which we'll talk about in a later slide. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I can imagine. And I think, again, families can have good intentions, but there is that fine line between, you know, the adult son pushing an agenda. And again, the client is the aging adult. Exactly. And so, you know, the whole goal here is to protect your family. And part of protecting the family, and this is on my questionnaire, is how are your assets titled? You know, how's the car titled, the house? the investment account? Do you have named beneficiaries? Because if there's named beneficiaries, they, and you put somebody else in the will, the named beneficiary is going to get the asset, regardless of what the will says. So you have to know how everything's titled so you can protect your client and their family. Yeah. Part of <clears throat> um, meeting with them and going through this is, is what's the best plan for the family? You know, do we need a guardianship for a disabled adult child? Do we need a trust for a disabled adult child? I've had a couple cases like that where they're in their 70s, they have adult disabled kids in their 30s, and if they give them their assets, they'll lose their federal benefits. So we develop a trust, um, a special needs trust, so they can receive their inheritance without affecting their uh, disability money. So it's really very specialized um, to each family's needs. Um, some families don't need that, and so we don't have to go into that. Um, you also want to choose, if you have the opportunity, who do you want to be the guardian of your children? It is not set in stone, but it is very strong evidence for the court of who's going to raise the children. I just had a case here in Omaha that both parents died, and an aunt and an uncle were fighting over who was going to be the guardian for the five children. There were five. Oh my goodness. And there was there was no will. And so it was contested and it was ugly and there were feelings were hurt. And so you really at any age, especially if you have children, you need to include that in your will. You need to include that as part of your estate plan. So and many people want to include their pets. You know, I want my sister to take care of my pet or anything that's personal to you like that. You know, yeah. there's there's all there's trust for pets. There people love their pets. I'm so not you gotta, surprised. That's, I am that's not part surprised. of the family plan. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, don't forget that, everyone. <laughs> yes. So the so the yeah. fifth thing is determine and establish the necessary directives. So, like I said, it's it's personal to each family. If you have a um, uh, adult disabled child, then there are necessary directives that need to be in that will. If you don't, then don't. You know, don't waste the time. Don't waste your client's money. It just complicates things. Some of these can be very simple. Um, number six is naming your beneficiaries. Now, just as important as naming your beneficiaries, unfortunately, is naming who you do not want to inherit something. So, yeah, I, I did have a case. I had a, yes, I had a couple cases where one was was ugly, and and they were disinheriting their son and they put it specifically in their will because it has to be specifically in there. And that, you know, that hurt feelings, but it was right there and everybody understood why. And then there was another case where they were disinheriting their daughter because they gave her inheritance ahead of time. And so we documented mm -hmm. that clearly in the will. It wasn't because of hard feelings. It was because they came to this agreement and the daughter knew it and the parents knew it. So Again, very personal, very particular to that family. Um, find a trusted partner. That's, you know, usually there's at least one trusted person in a family, whether it's an aunt, an uncle, a child, um, uh, your your next door neighbor that you've known for 40 years. You know, you, you really make sure it's somebody they trust, and you talk about that person a little bit with your client, in my opinion. Um, Number eight, create your plan. And I create that, again, based off my questionnaire. And, um, you know, some people have very specific questions. Can I put my funeral arrangements in there? 
you know, and, and of course you can. That can be part of your will. Um, number nine, let's see. Uh, sign, witness, and notarize. So that's that's kind of important. I have that a, is important. <laughs> yes. I, I You don't want to send them away and say, go proofread this, and it's okay if you execute it. You don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. So you you have two witnesses and a notary, and there is a will signing checklist I go through, particularly if they're older clients where I, you know, look at their driver's license, I go through the will page by page, I talk about, you know, if they're on any medication, are you under duress, um, I kind of gauge their mental status that day, you know, just mm -hmm. to be mindful that they are doing this of their own free will. And yep. so I, I go through that and take some time line by line, and then I bring my witnesses in, introduce them to my clients, and then we we execute it. Um, notify your executor. That's uh, another word for executor is personal representative. And that person um, usually knows by the time we're executing it that they've been named. Um, they either come with them at some point or the client says, oh, yeah, yeah, she knows. Mary knows she's going to be my personal representative. So you don't have to formally notify them or send them a court document. Um, I send them a copy of the will with the permission of the client, just as another avenue to make sure you can get it when you need it. Yeah. Um, now, storing your planning documents is turning into a whole new uh, market. There are apps I that imagine. you can have. Oh, it's, it's really convenient. And I, I'll tell you a story. That's the best way to teach, I think, is um, when my dad had a stroke, we went to the hospital, and there's a lot of us siblings, and I'm his power of attorney, and the nurse said, you know, who's the power of attorney? And I said, I am. And he said, well, I need to see a copy of it. Well, he had just had a stroke, and nobody's thinking clearly. Well, I carried it on my cell phone. And so I brought it up, <laughs> and I handed him my cell phone. And the the triage nurse about had a stroke himself because he, he was so excited that I had access yes. to it. Finally, so, someone who's got it. Yeah, and so I keep those, you know, it doesn't have a social security number or anything like that on it, but just some mm -hmm. of those general planning documents. There are apps that you can use. There are, um, you know, people have the, the box at the bank, the security box. They have the fire box proof at home. Um, but I, you know, anymore, I just make sure the executor has a copy, the bank has a copy, the doctor's office has a copy of the health care, and then um, I have a copy in one location at home that somebody knows where it's at. Because as you said, yeah. in these emergencies, one of the reasons I like practicing in this area because things do move quickly, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. But, um, you know, in times of high emotion, it, it's hard to think straight, right? Where, where are all these documents? Right. So. And that's so the whole point of planning is to be prepared. But again, that means hat, making sure it's signed and, you know, you know how, where to find it and that it's updated, right? Exactly. How often does it happen exactly. that, that, you know, a, a change is made, you get divorced, a uh, spouse dies, something happens and, and nothing's updated. That can cause some chaos. Well, it really does. And that brings us to the 12th step of updating as needed over time. Again, I had a case where, um, this woman wanted to do some Medicaid planning, and she had her ex-husband on the house still. And they had been divorced 22 years. Oh and so God. I said, well, we got to get him off the house. And, you know, And so I had to special order the divorce decree and go through the Register of Deeds office and take all these steps because she just forgot. And that's yeah. You know, that's not unfixable. You can fix that. You know, it's just, yeah. it's a hassle and it, and it costs you more money. Not uncommon, yeah. though. But just, you know, if you go through life events, a spouse dies, a child dies or becomes disabled, a divorce occurs, you win the lottery, a anything. You should update <laughs> it as needed. Definitely. <laughs> and it, and I'd like to make update, that. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a minor update, you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, a lawyer can draft a codicil, and it's just a uh, change to the will. And you maybe you want a different personal representative. 
you don't need to rewrite your whole will. You know, there's no need for that. If you're just changing something small, you draft a codicil for your client, which is much mm-hmm. cheaper and easier. Okay, good, good. So, you know, it's 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 it, it may look complicated, steps one through twelve, but essentially, it's it's basic common sense in, in terms of just understanding what you want, who should be involved, who things are left to, getting the right documents, being able to find them, and uh, updating them as appropriate. Good, good. Plan. But let's talk about the medical documents, because I think even myself as a gerontologist, I get kind of confused. So can we walk through some of the essential medical documents? Yes, absolutely. So the power of attorney for health care um, obviously designates who makes your health care decisions. Um, it's not, um, you know, it's not what bank are you going to go to. It's not the financial mm-hmm. side of things. It's the health care side. And whenever I draft that for anybody, I tell them, put a copy of this at your doctor's offices. And and I've heard back from the doctors that they appreciate that. As long as it's in the file, you know, they're good. Um, The living will informs physicians, families of um, what medical treatment you want should you become incapacitated. And that can be as personal as you want it. I put it as in one document as my power of attorney for health. Um, the do not resuscitate order um, is in there. Sometimes the doctor's offices and hospitals have a separate, um, just DNR order, separate page, um, along with the directives given in the living given in the living will. Um, the DNR is just do not. It just focuses on the CPR. It doesn't affect other treatment options, and sometimes. People get that mixed up, Um, and and sometimes, you know, the medical professionals say, you know, the CPR would be worse on an 80-year-old than a 50-year-old. You know, that's a a pretty aggressive move by the healthcare professional, and so that you really got to narrow down what the DNR means um, because it it means something different for a 50-year-old who's in good health versus an 87-year-old with lung cancer, let's say. So, but those are all decisions that you make. I always tell them, please talk to your healthcare provider and your family or your reverend or minister or priest to make these decisions um, what you're you're most comfortable with. Because, you know, even if you don't do it, then it leaves it up to the family. And, uh, you know, that's really upsetting. Again, emotional. One brother might think something where the daughter thinks something else. And, you know, it's very easy to point to the document and say, no, now this is how they wanted it done. And that easily ends the argument, you know, because you know what they want. Um, Five wishes is another advanced directive document, but it's more, it's not so many legalese, right? It's got more just direct, normal language, I call it. It was written with the help of the American Bar Association Commission on Law and Aging, so it is recognized as a legal document. Um, There's a lot of information online about um, five wishes. Um, It's also known as a letter of last instruction, um, but it's comparable to a living will, but written in layman's terms, basically. Okay. All right. And I think towards the end, we'll kind of go through some resources, but uh, we're happy to answer any questions um, that people have. But I guess the question I have in general with some of this is, yeah, so if I have a power, you know, if I find a living will, I mean, how do, how do my healthcare professionals know? Let's say I go to the emergency room. How are they going to know that my doctor has these documents? Any more, they see, at least in, in Omaha and Nebraska, they seem to all be linked. Um, yeah. Usually, whoever is with you knows that they have it. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, say they take the individual to the ER alone, you know, they really don't know. And so right. they go through their protocol, and then you get there, and maybe they're hooked up to a trach or something. Then you show up with the living will and decide the next step. So sometimes... You're just not going to get there, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, it's, once it's, things it's not progress, so yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And over communicate. I mean, I think that's a good tip, right? If it's you right. and you want people to know what your wishes are, over communicate. 
uh, can't stress that enough. Let's talk about some of the financial and estate planning documents. So switching out of the healthcare to uh, some of the specific documents in the estate plan. Okay, so the, the easiest one is POA, Power of Attorney for Finance. And that we draft in, I always say, give it to your banker, give it to your mm-hmm. investment advisor, give it to the power of attorney. Um, I always draft that copies are acceptable. So when you go into a bank, they shouldn't have to ask for the original. There's a paragraph in there that says the copy of this document is acceptable. So you don't have to run around with the originals. You can keep those in your safe box or wherever you keep your estate plan. Um, But I do distribute those to the bank and the investment advisor or even the retirement office or human resources at your company, uh, just so they know. Um, Mm -hmm. The digital power of attorney is is somewhat new. Um, That gives them access to um, your online presence. So most, Mm used older generation uses Facebook, right? But you still need to know their passwords, their usernames. So when they are no longer living, you want to move that, you want to erase that online presence. So, you know, you can avoid identity theft. And so uh, you want to give all those passwords associated. Usually the digital power of attorney and power of attorney for finance is the same one. And I include a paragraph about digital uh, presence and digital power of attorney in my power of attorney for finance. So I don't charge two separate amounts for two different documents because a paragraph or two will cover that in your power of attorney for finance. The wills and living trusts, we went through the wills a little a little bit mm-hmm. earlier. Um, living trusts, um, that can be part of your estate plan. Not everybody needs a living trust. Uh, there are different kinds of trusts. You put uh, assets, whether it's a house or a retirement account or an insurance, um, life insurance uh, policy in there. And the trust is used, most most people allow it used to avoid probate. So your uh, assets can be accessed quicker by a third party. That third party is called a trustee. And so it does cost more to do a trust with a will but not significantly more. Um, okay. Trust, there's all different kinds of trust. So we're just going to hit the highlights here. There's revocable and irrevocable. Yeah, let me, I can go through. Let's fl- flip to that. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, a revocable, revocable trust can help you pass your assets outside of probate, but you still control them during your lifetime. And that is very important for some people, they they don't feel like they want to give up all control of their money yet. They still want to control it. So say we set up a, a revocable living trust and you put the house in it and they decide, well, we're going to sell the house and I'm going to move to an apartment. Well, they still have control over that asset then. It's flexible. They can sell the house. They can do what they want. Um, the living trust becomes irrevocable upon death and then it's usually referred to in the will and it's part of a testamentary trust or can be. The irrevocable trust, as it says, um, it transfers your assets out of your control, out of the reach of estate taxes and probate, and it cannot be changed by the grantor or the person who executed it. Their irrevocable trusts are used in Medicaid planning and those are, Important to work with an elder law attorney. We'll talk briefly about that later, but an irrevocable trust can be Medicaid compliant and can help you with your estate plan if you think you're going to need long-term care down the road. And then, of course, the testamentary trust is the last one. It's, It's one that is in effect after death, and it's set up through your will. Okay. All right. So what are the benefits of a trust? Because, you know, even myself, my husband and I set up a trust and we just updated it. Fortunately, we signed it, notarized it, all that good stuff. So, so far I'm on good track. Um, But for people who are trying to decide a will versus a trust, um, you know, what's the benefits of the trust? The benefits of the trust is, um, I'll start at the the last one. It's 
for some people it's a privacy matter. You don't have to go through probate then, which means it's not a public document. It's not a public mm -hmm. record. Um, you can pass these uh, assets outside of probate and still remain private. Um, that saves on court fees, time, and some taxes. Um, it can help you protect your trust from creditors or other beneficiaries who can't handle money. Uh, so within that trust, you can uh, do what's a special needs trust, which I mentioned earlier about um, setting up a trust for a disabled adult child or a spendthrift trust for a grandchild that doesn't manage money very well or is a minor. <laughs> you can set up the trust that way. Um, and you set up the terms of it. You know, they can have it at the age of 25 or they can have it after they get their PhD or something restrictive along those yeah. lines. Good. Gives you a little bit more control for how that's distributed and lets you be thoughtful of those things. That makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Well, let's let's talk about storing and retrieving. We've talked about that a little bit already. Um, any other thoughts on, on this? I think we've kind of addressed it. Yes. I mean, again, most important, have it with your doctor, your bank, your investment advisor, and PR, personal representative, and the power of attorney. Make sure they have copies. Um, have it on your phone even if, if you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. that. That's very easy to carry around. Everybody has their phone with them all the time, right? And so that's easy. Yes. Um, and the other thing that, and this is part of storing and retrieving, but it's kind of safeguarding. Uh, Eversafe is a fraud monitoring program specifically uh, for the elderly. And so that, you can look online for that app. Um, and that might help. Just to see, oh, mom's mom's uh, getting too many credit cards out, and you're the power of attorney for finance here, and you're like, oh, she's got a <laughs> habit of opening credit cards. I've seen that. And so that would give you warning that grandma's opening too many credit cards or something like that. So that helps, mm -hmm. too, with storing, keeping track of your legal documents. Um, I know a few people that are just starting to do that um, with their own parents. Yeah. And I think we'll see more and more tools. I, I know, Kathleen, you and I both talked about technology can be a challenge, but I think in some of these examples, any kind of resource that helps us keep all this stuff organized, you know, is, is valuable. So you said that app was called Eversafe? Is that correct? Eversafe, yes. And it's basically right. fraud I'm monitoring. Check that out. I'm yeah. 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 It's, it's okay. a good app. Yeah. Well, and certainly I've done enough presentations on uh, fraud amongst the elderly as well, and so all of this is so important. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about um, Medicaid planning, and, and it says, well, I don't know if it is or isn't. Why is Medicaid planning an ethical dilemma? What do we need to know about that? Well, in, in my practice, it isn't because I'm... <laughs> willing to turn right. clients away, you know, when they come in and yeah. all they're worried about is their inheritance, right? That's a red flag. Right. This is, okay. this is um, and they do talk, you know, I've been to enough seminars and such that there is, Medicaid planning does have a bad uh, reputation sometimes, but it, but it's planning. It's not, I compare it to tax planning, right? You're using the tax yeah, code exactly. to your benefit. And so with the Medicaid planning, it's the same thing. You're using the Medicaid rules and regulations to your benefit in your estate plan. Um, and so you're not hiding any assets. You're actually mm -hmm. listing out all the assets for the Medicaid to review. And then you decide if you can title them or move them in a different place to preserve them. And, you know, the number one thing I tell families is, you know, that money's there for mom and dad. They worked hard for it. That's their retirement. That's We're not worried about your inheritance. But I will say, every parent that walks through the door, they all say, oh, I want to leave something to my kids, though. And, and you know, if, if that's possible, if you plan ahead, you plan early, and it fits within the regulations, then, then that's a plus. But oftentimes, there's crisis planning that has to go on where, you know, one parent goes down and they've got to go into a nursing home and the other one wants to stay in the house. And there are protections and strategies we can use 
um, to allow one spouse to be in the home and one to be in the long-term care facility. But, um, you know, the goal is That's not... an important way to look at it, yeah, because it's not just about, um, you know, uh, avoiding the cost, because, you know, one thing that I continue to try to educate people on is there is a cost associated with growing old. People think everything's going to be paid for. They don't understand Medicare versus Medicaid, all these types of things. So that's, thank you for kind of clarifying that. Yeah. And if, if they're legally sanctioned strategies, you know, like, like I said, with mm -hmm. tax planning, you know, and you just got to know who to, to excuse from your office if you think they want you to cross a line. And, gotcha. and like I said, you're not hiding anything. You're listing every single asset with Medicaid and you're working with Medicaid on the spend down. You know, I've worked with, um, Medicaid agents through the state of Nebraska that say, well, they're $12,000 over, you should consider doing A, B, and C. It's, it can be mm -hmm. a good relationship to do what's best for your client without turning it into an ethical dilemma. And so you just gotcha. have to know those strategy, strategies. Yeah, good. Well, I think for the next time, I'm going to change the title of this because I think it is... Um, You've just made some very good points there. It's not necessarily an ethical dilemma. It is planning based on all the legal um, aspects that you're aware of and, and protecting for perhaps another spouse, right? So Correct. Very good. Correct. Yeah. Yes, right. absolutely. Let's talk about capacity because this is a tough, tough issue. Um, how do we decide whether an older person or older adult is legally competent? I do a lot of guardian ad litem work in uh, probate court, in, in adult court, and um, you know that's that's the big issue: is this person competent? Do they need a guardian? And um, you know, oftentimes we're able to order the court if the court's involved. The court orders the individual to have a, a psychiatric psychiatric gerontology appointment or something very specialized to make a medical determination of capacity. Um, and so the difference though, legally, sometimes people come in and out of capacity during the day. Yeah. Um, you, you know, sometimes they're better in the morning. They can make better decisions. They're more alert. Um, so you really have to do your homework, make your own observation of your client, ask the right medical questions, um, and if you're not comfortable, you know, send them to a specialist to get an ex a competency exam. And so you feel better about making that plan. Uh, I've, I've said it before. I've had clients where the, the kids come in and they do all the talking, right? And so mm -hmm. I, ha I have to excuse them and talk to mom and dad by themselves. And usually you know pretty quickly whether they're competent after the kids leave the room. Um, and you know if, if the kids are up to something, too, if they yeah. willingly go and you're able to have a nice conversation. Um, and, you know, I have a checklist that I use and, and things I look for. And so if, if the kids are cooperative with that, that's a pretty good sign that, okay, you know, this person's probably with it and is on board with what we're trying to do here. But, but if they give you a, a bit of a problem, then that to me is a red flag and I really, really look into mm -hmm. it. You know, you know, are they listening? Are they understanding? Are they listing, um, you know, who their beneficiaries beneficiaries are? Can they talk about how they made their money, or you know, just some background information on them? Um, so you can you can have capacity at different times of the day too. So I try yeah, to meet them, I, it, it, you know, more course. than once. Yeah. Yes, yes. And again, example of my aunt. She's been in the hospital for two weeks. She's on some heavy duty uh, uh, medications for an infection and her doctor comes in and is talking to her like she's alert and oriented and I'm sitting here looking at him like he has two heads quite frankly I was like don't exactly. you understand that it's, <laughs> at this current time this woman can't is not comprehending anything you're saying now she, two days later she's better thank goodness right uh, but right. he doesn't know that you know um, and, you know, looking at this document, I know we've got a lot more to cover, so we'll move on. But, you know, the sexual consent capacity of somebody's in a retirement community or they've got a new boyfriend, um, you know, it gets super complicated. And as a gerontologist, I continually say, 
um, if the person, if the older aging adult is able, is competent and able to make their own decisions, then we don't have to agree with them. Um, right. So that's why I have right. a uh, special uh, interest in this topic. Capacity versus competency. What's the difference there? Well, capacity is, is well, like it says, the ability to make those decisions. So you can articulate mm -hmm. them. Um, you can tell them what those decisions are. And you can put them into effect. You can sign your name. You can ask valid questions. You can go to the bank and have a conversation. Um, both of those things. Um, I, there mm -hmm. are some people that have capacity, but for what, for, you know, they've had a stroke or something, they can only sign their name with an X. Um, and, mm -hmm. and those, those stickier situations, I really like to have my medical evidence backing me up on it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and going back to your last comment, um, I did have a guardianship case where, um, this, young woman wanted guardianship over her dad and it was a situation where uh, she didn't like his decisions it didn't mean I said it doesn't mean he needs a guardian you just don't agree with <laughs> what he's doing and so, so she, there is different. a very big distinct oh gosh yes and there's a big distinction there um, and so sometimes you've got to be the bad guy and tell him that <laughs> yeah and I, I I personally feel very strongly about that because and you know I think we always want to protect aging adults Sometimes it's the intentions are good, sometimes they're not. But overall, I think most people, family members and professionals, we want to protect the aging adult. But if they choose to make bad decisions, uh, if they are competent to do that, for example, uh, maybe he wants to continue smoking cigars when he shouldn't or um, right. they decide, um, you know, that they're, they're going to eat things that they shouldn't or, you know, whatever. It's like, well, you know, it's it's this. Just as this slide says, it's really about it ebbs and flows, it fluctuates, circumstances are different. And I always say, pick and choose your battles. <laughs> you right. know, that's there's a very lot. good advice. I think that's good advice. Absolutely. Well, we've talked a little bit about what happens when you don't plan, and this is for all of us. Um, your family will have to go to court. You have no control over who inherits your assets, and you have no control over your medical, financial, and legal decisions if you were incapacitated. And let's face it, everyone, you know, life changes on a dime these days. How do we know that something's not going to happen, a car accident or uh, a medical uh, circumstance that happens and changes everything? So this is for all of us. We need to know that we have to plan. It is, and it's for all of us at every stage, right? So I've got kids in yes. college, and they're all over the age of 19, and I can't, you know, tell them, I can't go look at their medical records, right? So I have powers mm -hmm. of attorney yep. for all my young adult children. So it isn't just your parents who are in their 80s or 90s. It, it goes as far mm -hmm. down as 19, because God forbid, things do happen quickly. Um, and yep. then you would have to go. I had a client who child went to school in Rhode Island and he got in a bad accident and they wouldn't talk to the parents and they had to fly up there and get a guardianship. So they had to get oh an emergency goodness. guardianship, which under those circumstances, an emergency, you get it within 48 hours, that's still not fast enough, right? You, you need it yeah. immediately, you know. So it, and the stress when you don't of plan, that situation oh, alone. It, it, was, it was really, really difficult. Um, and so you want it all laid out in writing. Um, you have no yeah. control over who inherits your assets. It goes by statute, and it goes in order. Yeah. So the state will decide what goes where and when, and that's going to be twice as long. <laughs> I can tell you that. Yeah. And who wants to leave anything up to their state? I mean, let's face no. it. Let's, yeah. let's take a minute to think about this, people. Let's take the time. And if we don't plan, as we said, um, it, it can go through probate. So can you just quickly kind of talk about the probate process? I know we're, we're running close to end of time. I want to have time for questions. But what do we need oh. to know about the probate process? The probate process is not as scary as everybody thinks. It's um, yeah, anymore. It sounds like, awful. I can't. <laughs> Yeah, I can do it online. There's, there are some cases you don't even need to have a court appearance. Everything's electronically mm. filed, and it can be very simple. Um, but it is better to have a will. It goes faster. If there's no will, 
or you have what's called a holographic will, which is a handwritten will, that takes a little longer in probate. But you basically locate all the assets, pay the debts, pay the taxes, and then distribute it to all the beneficiaries according to the will or according to statute if there's no will. So not scary, not really. No, no. I think everything, you know, everything we don't understand can certainly feel very overwhelming, but it is just a process. But again, some of these things can be avoided with the right planning. So lots of resources that we've got for you here, um, lists and ways to go about finding elder law specialists, online resources, life care planning. Kathleen, anything you want to say about um, these resources? I would just say uh, your local bar, state bar association is usually uh, your best place to start. Okay, very good, very good. And just as we look at the next slide, uh, well, we, we put um, online will makers. I mean, clearly this is a very complicated process. So I don't want to ask your opinion, <laughs> but we did put well, it on there because, you know, yeah. I've had people to... ask it. Yeah, and I don't, yeah. mind, I don't, I'm not, you know, offended by it, that's for sure. If you have something very simple and you need something quickly, um, it's better than nothing, uh, really. Better than nothing. But if, if you have any specific things you want done, you you should go to an attorney to get make sure that's in there correctly. Um, mm -hmm. Nebraska's Legal Aid has a medical legal project here, and they go actually go into the hospitals and are willing to draft wow. wills and powers of attorney. So that that's a nice oh, nice program we have here. Yeah, so check to see what's available before you lo uh, locally. But just bottom line is um, anything is better than nothing. Right. And on that note, uh, let's open it up to questions. And um, I um, don't, I'll uh, allow uh, our friends at ASA to come in and help us with that because I don't see the chat for some reason. Absolutely. That's okay. Yeah. Um, one great question that just came in um, is if, if an individual is not married and do not have any children or other family, what would be the reason to have a will? Well, if they own any assets, if they have a house or cars or anything like that, they can direct exactly where those assets go. Uh, if it's the retirement plans or anything like that. Um, they should have a will. It will go by statute, and so most likely it would go to their parents, um, that person's parent. But it, uh, if, if you have any specific wishes or plans, you should have a will. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting question because uh, many people, for example, I don't have children. Um, and, um, you know, they always think, well, who would I leave it to? Well, I, I would imagine people still have their own passions charities, organizations, um, you know, that they would want to leave. So bottom line is something has to occur with the assets that are left, whatever they are. Um, and I think some people have left um, money or estates to their dogs. Is that true, Kathleen? <laughs> yep, that's true. They have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what other questions do we have? And I think Kathleen just referred, uh, you know, referenced the statutes, but we had a question come in about, is there a state formula on how things are divided if there's, or how decisions, who makes decisions if these, if these documents are not in place, or if a person is at a point where they are no longer legally able to sign documents? Um, is that determined by the state that you live in? Uh, yes, oftentimes, uh, say for instance, somebody passes in a nursing home and there's no will and there's no family, the nursing home will file probate with the estate and there's what is called a special administration. So there is an avenue through the courts to settle that estate. And sometimes they appoint lawyers to be the special administrator and then you try to track down errors and, and things like that. So there is court procedures to handle those kinds of situations. Okay, and, and kind of along the same lines is, what if you have an individual that is just strictly unwilling to even, to even update their documents or they don't want to talk about these documents, they don't want to talk about what will happen after they're gone? Um, is there something that, family members can do to, to help prepare themselves if that if their loved one is just not willing to talk about it? 
you know, just keep your eyes and ears open. They, they might drop hints. Um, if they're willing to write it down in their own handwriting and just date it, that could be proven in court as a will. Um, or, you know, find an attorney that will maybe if they'll go to the house, they're more comfortable. I do make house calls, and that makes some people more comfortable. Um, but at a minimum, see if they'll write it down themselves and get it off their, their heads on, in writing and date it and sign it, and that could be used as a will. And right. I always say there's there's meaning behind behavior, right? right? So my thought would be, why are they so reluctant? They have a terrible uh, opinion of lawyers, or they think somebody's going to take their money. So I think you can always dig around to better understand why they feel that way, and then help them understand how documents can help them achieve their goals, not take it away from them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's important to remember is these are people, these are that individual's final decisions. And, and I think it's very important that we all recognize and respect those documents and those wishes as hard as it may be to, you know, as a healthcare power of attorney to, to make decisions because you don't want to let them go or things like that. But, um, you know, you, it, just think of it as the best way to honor your loved one is, is to follow their wishes. Um, so I think that's that's very important. And I loved how you referenced um, M Medicaid, you know, pr not necessarily protecting assets, but the process to access Medicaid and how, and I will, I think I would also advise that it is different um, depending on where you live and, and how that works. And, but I think you're absolutely right when it's, when you discuss that Medicaid is there as a resource, and, and we're not necessarily protecting assets from that, but we are working with the system, not against it, um, as we are with Medicare and other, you know, entities. Absolutely. So thank you both so much for your time. I think this has been a really great discussion. I, we do have time for maybe just one or two more questions. Um, one was, how binding is a transfer on death deed? Is that something that you would recommend? Uh, and I, I'm not really familiar with that term. Uh, some states don't allow it. So what I just did a transfer on death deed for a house. The biggest problem with them is if you don't file it with the register of deeds before death, it is not, um, it's not valid. And that's the number one mistake people make. They fill out a transfer on death deed and they fail to file it with the register of deeds office. So I've never had one be reversed. They're a pretty slick way of transferring property as long as you execute the deed before death. Very good. Um, and and so some people are asking why is it necessary to have these documents notarized or, or to have a witness? Uh, I think just to, to back, they're, they're so, they carry so much power that I think they want to make sure it's this right person signing the document and there are enough witnesses and it's their signature and just to boost basically the honesty of it, you know, and the validity of it in court. Yeah, I like that. Excellent. I want, uh, yeah, I think that's important. Right. Well, thank you again both so much. Uh, I, I think this is such a topic that a lot of people want to hear it multiple times, um, and it's so important, and it's it's very universal. It, like you said, everybody should be talking about these, and no matter what age you are. Um, and I would always recommend people look to their local and state resources um, that are available to them, and, and of course, other attorneys that are in their area. And we just thank you both for your time and your expertise. Um, but we have reached the end of our hour. I would like to let you know that you will be receiving a email by the end of the day today with the PowerPoint slides that you can download from there as well as the link to apply for your CEUs. Again, you have 30 days, I'm sorry, 60 days to apply for your CEUs and 30 days, um, it'll take up to 30 days for us to process and issue those. Thank you again for joining us. If you would like to join us for our next webinar, you can do that by visiting the ASA website at asaaging.org, and we hope to see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.